Good morning and welcome to the ninth meeting of the Equalities and Human Rights Committee. I thank all members and witnesses for their attendance today in these difficult circumstances. I also thank parliamentary staff, in particular Broadcasting Office, for all their hard work in setting up this remote and formal meeting of the committee. The committee recognises the very challenging times in which we are living and we pay tribute to all of the organisations in the equalities and human rights sector for their continued dedicated service and hard work at this time. Now, we are clear we do not want to place undue pressure on anyone during this public health emergency, but it is important that parliamentary scrutiny and accountability continues. I am very grateful, therefore, to the witnesses and others for finding time to answer questions from the committee and for the way that they and other bodies have responded so quickly to our calls for views. Responses to our ongoing call for views are on our website. Our main item of business this morning is our second evidence session on how COVID-19 has impacted on equalities and human rights. We will have two panels. I welcome our witnesses on the first panel this morning, Trishna Singh, OBE, Founder and Director of Sikh Sanjog, Khalida Noon, Founder and Executive Director, Intercultural Youth Scotland, and Michael Matavu, Founder and Director of Radiant and Brighter. You are all very welcome this morning. And I refer members to Paper 1, which is a private paper by SPICE. Unusually, because of the challenges in managing a virtual meeting such as this, we are going to take questions in a pre-arranged order. I will now invite members to ask questions, and then I will invite the witnesses to respond, also in a pre-arranged order. If you have nothing to add to a question, please do not feel the need to speak. You can simply say so. I will then go back to each member for any follow-up questions. Once completed, I will invite the next questioner, and so on, until the evidence session is concluded. I expect this panel's evidence session to last for no more than one hour. And I ask that people keep um, questions and answers succinct, please. Please wait for me to announce you and give broadcasting staff a few seconds to operate your microphones before beginning to ask your questions or provide an answer. So we will now move on to questions. And if I can start with the first question, which is to ask panel members how um, the community that you provide services for are being affected um, by the pandemic and by the measures put in place to, to deal with it and to try and keep people safe. And if I can come to Trishna Singh first. Trishna. Thank you, Kalmina. Um, we, as an organisation, have transitioned from a face to face organisation to online within 10 days of the lockdown being put into place. And currently, we are providing services for over 100 individuals from the Sikh community in Edinburgh. The 95% of those people are from the Sikh community, and some are from other ethnic backgrounds put in a package of support which includes food parcels and when we've been linking in with the food banks, there has been no provision for Asian food supplies in that. So we have intervened and put those into place. Um, we have put out a defending phone call service that we didn't have in place before and that's been into place and we're supporting women um, across Edinburgh with, with that service. Equally we're still running our youth groups which is service for about 20, 25 young people uh, every week on a weekly basis and keeping in contact with them. There's been a high increase in women experiencing domestic violence and abuse, and that has increased. And we are currently supporting 15 women from within our small community in Edinburgh by phone and also linking them in with other services that we feel that would be helpful to them. We've created an in-house counselling service um, to support women by phone, and that includes our staff because there's lots of stress for the women that are hearing all of these. So all of that has been went into place through just Sikh Sanjo. But in general, from the wider Sikh community, there is no Sikh body in Scotland. So the Sikh Federation and the Sikh network that are based in England have been asking questions um, of Scottish government about the data around COVID. And although there's been a Sikh community in Scotland for over 80 years, there's not the specific health vulnerabilities reported by leading medical journals about Sikh background not been properly considered by the Scottish Government. 
And this has been brought into focus now more with this outbreak of COVID. Um, the Scottish Health Bodies Government have no idea on the number of seats tested positive for COVID or the number of seat deaths occurring from the disease in Scotland. I think that's yeah. that's just that's, I was just going to say that's an area which we definitely wish to probe in more detail. Um, colleagues come on to, to that specific um, question. So is there anything else you want to add in terms of how your organisations adapted or how the community um, has been affected? The, the, the definite closure of the Sikh temple in Edinburgh has affected the community immensely because that was one of the places where people um, congregate every week. And I just um, on Monday I contacted the, the president of the Gurf Parah here in Edinburgh, and they've had no guidance or support from any authority with regards to the closing of the premises or opening the premises. And they've been relying on information from the Sikh Federation, the Sikh Network, um, from England that they are sending up information to say this is what we are doing in England and they are using that as a guideline. So there has been nothing from anybody, any authorities here in Scotland making contact with the Sikh World for us. And that's okay. quite concerning. Yes. Yes. Okay, I would, I would share your concern in that. Thank you um, for that. Can I ask the um, same question to Khalida, please? Khalida. Hello, thank you, convener. All of Intercultural Youth Services are available online to see what we're doing and on our Instagram and our Twitter. I don't want to go into everything we're doing because I think this platform is a time for really showing what groups and individual, individuals are impacted by COVID-19. It's difficult for me to begin without mentioning what black people are experiencing in the world and the trauma that has been seen felt by young black Bain Scots. Intercultural Youth Scotland makes a plea to keep in your mind throughout our COVID-19 evidence the devastating impact this is having on young black Scots. Intercultural Youth Scotland has been working in consultation with our youth anti-racist ambassadors and their peers during the current COVID-19 crisis and they are commission, uh, commissioning a robust report on the impact of COVID-19, with particular focus on the education and 16-plus young BAME school leavers. Collaborating with anti-racist educator and SAMI, the report and recommendations will be available at the end of July. We need to recognise and acknowledge inequality in services provided. Unfortunately, as the number of young BAME Scots have increased in Scotland, Schools and services are not ready to serve them, which highlights the need for practitioners to be, to be prepared. There is limited funding dedicated to the anti-racist mental health services and education, which has contributed to the lack of availability of resources devoted to young BAME Scots. Just one of the recent examples, local authority grants and children and families have not funded adequate BAME youth provision for 14 and 19 to 19 year olds in the city, despite Intercultural Youth Scotland's youth anti-racist ambassadors campaigning hard over the last year. They have delivered four deputations and commissioned their insight report, a robust collection of the experience and perceptions of young BAME Scots in Scottish secondary schools. From Intercultural Youth Scotland's four deputations, councillors listened and highlighted a gap in BAME youth services for 13 to 19 year olds. But despite many meetings, deputations highlighted several case studies of racist hate crime and attacks in Scottish schools, evidence of under-reporting, evidence of teachers not following procedures, local authority failed to dedicate any funding in this area for the next three years and in particular services that focus on black young people who right now only have social media to depend on. They are more than ever fearful of the police, frustrated with their education and not having basic rights and opportunities. There is a growing anger. Apart from IYS, the service is non-existent in Edinburgh and with the impact of COVID-19 and the murders of innocent black people, this will have devastating consequences. Okay, thank you. And there's a lot in that, and we will we will get into um, more of the more of the specifics around that. Thank you, um, Michael. Can I ask um, the, the same question of you? How the community that you provide services um, to has been affected by the 
pandemic and the lockdown and for a brief reflection of any of the adaptations you've had to make to your to your service during the, the pandemic. Michael. Thank you. Thank you so much, Convina. Um I think uh, for us, one of the things that has been significant and that has affected our communities um, is around the value uh, for a very long time. In organization, we've highlighted the, 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 the skills and qualifications that uh, um, our communities bring. And uh, by communities, I mean our communities uh, from the BEM communities. Um, and so they come here with skills and qualifications, but often that is not uh, appreciated enough. And so with the COVID situation at the moment, it has highlighted more of these issues that we've been talking about for a very long time. And so you find that the people that we've always been supporting are working in low income jobs. They are on zero hour contracts. They're working in factories. They're in manual labor. Um, and because of the situation at the moment, it's an easy group of people to lay off and live out of in employment. So while um, we are talking about this issue, most of them can't even work from home if they work in factories. Most of them uh, even if they were given the opportunity to work from home, they don't have the laptops, they don't have that technology, they're not uh, educated enough to, to use the laptops. And so you find that uh, these, the, the COVID issue has really hit our communities really hard. But the way we have ad adapted with that is uh, we've, um, uh, uh, we are now providing online services to, uh, to our communities. So most of our services now are online. Um, but we also went an extra mile at the beginning of the of the of the pandemic. We realized that uh, most of the food provision that was out there wasn't cultural sensitive. So people were going to food banks, um, but the food banks were providing food that is not cultural sensitive. Um, I'll give you a scenario of uh, a story. I'll share a story of one of the parents, a single mom who's got a child um, who we contacted. Uh, and ask them about what, how they are coping and how they are going on with life. And, and they shared with us and say they had gone to a food bank, given the food from the food bank, but they couldn't eat that food. So they had tins in the cupboard, but still couldn't eat it. Um, and it's out of that that we decided as an organization, in fact, even without uh, going into uh, applying for funding, because Normally, when it comes to funding around these things, and you're talking about uh, BEM communities, it's very difficult to get uh, to get that funding. So we decided to use our own little funds as an organization that we had to reach out to these communities, and we had to go to African shops, to Asian shops, to buy food that suits the community. Um, so we've been doing that, and uh, we we are, we also um, decided to uh, provide laptops. To, to some of the people that we are supporting, because again, uh, people are in isolation. Most people uh, fail to engage with whatever is happening. The money is not there. Um, and so we decided uh, to loan the laptops that we have as an organization to some of the people in the community so that we can reach out to them and so that they could stay connected with whatever is happening. Okay. Thank you. That's very helpful. Um, and I'll now move on to questions from, from the committee. Um, Angela Constance, please. Angela. Good morning, convener, and good morning to the panel. Um, Kalida was uh, quite correct to make the point uh, about the Black Lives Movement in that we need to shine a light on race uh, inequality at home and act to address it as well as shining a light on inequalities uh, overseas. Now, the uh, Runnymede Trust have done some work to highlight that COVID uh, will increase the risk of race equalities. It will exacerbate race inequalities. Um, I'm particularly interested in employment. Um, now, bearing in mind that um, employment is reserved, but I would be very interested to hear uh, from the panel, uh, starting with Michael, uh, what more could the Scottish Government do in this regard? And then, of course, we'll hear from Kalida 
uh, with respect to young people, bearing in mind we know that young people are always hit doubly hard in the recession. And of course, we want to hear about the experience um, of women uh, as well. So if I could start with uh, Michael, please. Uh, what more can the Scottish Government do? Michael. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Angela. Um, I think one of the things that the Scottish Government needs to do is um, work more on the education side of things. And, and this is normally when we're talking about race equality, and obviously right now uh, what people are talking about is racism and all that. And I think there needs to be more education um, and more investment uh, for the Scottish Government because often uh, employers and, and training providers will, will come out and say they want to support people to get into employment, but they lack the understanding. They lack the understanding of the cultural differences. And, and while we are supporting people to get into employment, uh, they get into employment but face these challenges because of lack of that education, because lack of, of lack of uh, that, that awareness. So um, I think the Scottish Government needs to uh, create a lot of awareness. It needs to support employers in terms of, of some bit of support around uh, racism. Um, but I think most importantly, um, invest in, in that education side of things, because one of the issues that we've faced as an organization supporting people into employment is lack of funding. Um, you, we will always, we will often find employers, um, public sector, uh, private sector, third sector, saying they're keen to take on people from these communities, but they don't want to go through the education piece. They don't, they don't want, they don't have the money to, to invest, to, to do some of these things. So I think uh, from uh, the Scottish government perspective, I think there needs to be um, investment uh, to support the employers and other um, people who want to take on people from these communities. Thank you, Michael. Can I come to Khalida Noon now, please? Khalida. Education is key. Uh, there is evidence that young Bain Scots will face challenges receiving estimate grades from teachers. Schools are less affluent areas, will not have the previous performance privileges, and as a result, there is a greater risk of disadvantaged pupils from lower socio-economic backgrounds and from ethnic minority backgrounds. Already highlighted in the Race Equality Action Plan before COVID and, and the murders of black innocent people, young Bain Scots are more risk, at risk of leaving school with no positive destination and no support to assist in making timely and positive decisions, as there are currently a lack of culturally appropriate street-style services to support them. In November 2019, Intercultural Youth Scotland launched its, a first-of-its-kind report to, into the perceptions and experiences of young Bain Scots in Scottish schools. This report was based on an extensive survey led by our anti-racist ambassadors to their peers in Edinburgh and Glasgow and highlighted a lack of trust and engagement with teachers about race issues and sufficient anti-racist education, particularly among the women. A full report and recommendations can be accessed on our website. There are key statistics that clearly show existing bias and that if you're a person of colour, you're more than likely to come out at the bottom, which will inevitably lead to young people who are going through transitional periods, making the wrong choices, mental health issues, and many other costly destructive outcomes. Again, this has been highlight highlighted before COVID-19 and before the murders of innocent black people, therefore furthering the inequality and human rights of young Bain Scots. They are in a dangerous situation, which will cause structural disadvantage to deepen its implicit bias, which could influence te a teacher's decision to give a pupil a lower mark on assessments throughout the year and influence their final estimated grades. How many schools are preparing to support specific trauma experienced by young Bain Scots due to the COVID and the murders of innocent black people, and even heavier weight that will be held by pupils on their return when they're more likely to be fined by the police, suffer discriminatory policing, 
We already have the evidence that their experience of human rights are overlooked and access to employment, to education, to housing, experience, discrimination in these areas are less likely to access to these rights. All young Bain Scots are seen right now as police murders and brutality. Organisation leaders who have not ever spoken out before them now following the trend on the hashtag Black Lives Matter. This is not a trend, it is black lives. High numbers in their communities are dying and through COVID and poverty. This together with the thought of going back to school and having to stand up for themselves every day around anti-racism. With this in mind, it's a growing concern of London's influences and now Scotland drill music that promotes knife and drug crime, influencing the minds of young Bain Scots. Our young people have talents and gifts. They bring innovation and deep cultures. Let's not let drill music be the only way they express themselves, which, we, as we've seen in London, has devastating consequences. We, Intercultural Youth Scotland, just want to has a Restless Natives employability programme, which the Scottish Government are currently supporting on a pilot okay. programme. Sorry. Khalida, I, I really, I really hate to, to interrupt you, and I, and I yes, know I understand. I know the work of of your organisation and how closely connected you are to young people, and as mm. we have to hear from you. But I suppose what I'm really conscious of today is that we're so tight for time. So I wonder if that we will absolutely um look, we'll have we'll look to your report and, and we will we will get in about that and there will be more work for this committee to do it isn't just this session but i wonder if i could steer you around to ask for a couple of things that the scottish government could do to make a difference now during this crisis acknowledging the the the, the difficulties being experienced at the moment have not appeared because of because of the crisis the inequalities are are being exacerbated. They're not. They're not new. But I wonder if I could bring you back to Angela's question just for mm -hmm. things. Um, you have something to take. Yeah. So we have a Restless Natives program, and that's training on cultural um, appropriateness, cultural proficiency, and anti-racist education. The trouble is with our young people getting into jobs and getting into. Uh, adequate employment is lack of understanding and bias. It's about Scottish Government investing in young people to and, and organisations to truly um, educate and give them a chance. Not all young people are going to be brilliant at CVs and brilliant at, to, to, to get their themselves across in a positive way. It's about giving them a, a, a chance and using positive action more and more in, in ensuring that it actually works. And it is about anti-racist education in every in every being of society. Thank you. That's really helpful. Um, can I bring in Trishna Singh now? Um, Angela's question there was around um, employment and um, what actions the Scottish Government needs to take to improve for um, communities. Thank you, Julia. And I think most people um, know about the work of Six and Joe. We've been delivering services for the past 30 years in Edinburgh, and our services have always focused on linking the marginalised seat and other minority ethnic women to social, education, and employment opportunities. And over the years, we've developed into a holistic and intersectional organisation. But just focusing on the employment path, over the years, we have had funding from the Big Lottery Scottish Government to run pro projects. And the biggest one we ran was for four years with a Big Lottery project linked to our social enterprise. That became a vehicle for women to come in, volunteer, gain skills, and then move into mainstream employment. We did a, an, ex an external evaluation of that project after four years. And we presented it at the Scottish Government and um, the Scottish Parliament in 2016. Now, that evaluation and that report had recommendations at the back of it as well. And it was present, it was launched at the Parliament and it's taken four years for the Scottish Government to actually take notice of it. Now I have been around the Scottish Government and met with many ministers and mentioned that and handed out this copies of this evaluation report and it's never been taken up. And only recently I was at a cross party group. We closed the gap, presented yet another report 
on the lack of employment and things around BMU women, and there was no mention of the Sikh community. And I raised it there, and then I passed the report back on to the women from the Close the Gap. And just a couple of about at the beginning of the year, I received an email from them to say that they would be now using that information in their next report. But for me, it's it's very stark. There is some miscommunication with people with regards to the Sikh community. There is an assumption that all Sikh, the whole the whole of the Sikh community is either a doctor, a nurse, a lawyer, and working in some high high end job. Whereas we have a whole community of people that are just similar to the same white working class Scottish community. And for women, mainly a lot of them, and some there is there is research out there, but it's very sparse. Um, women, in, in the social workforce, there's over 80%, 85% of women from the BME communities in the beauty sector, leisure, retail and hospitality. And they have all been affected by COVID. All of them have lost their jobs, you know, none of them. I doubt if there's there's very few that I know that have been furloughed in any of these kind of um, situations. Now, the, we we held the very first ever Scottish Sikh Women's Conference in March this year, and we conducted a survey before the event actually took place, and over a hundred women from across Scotland took part in that. And the the findings were very stark, but unfortunately, because of lockdown, because the event happened on the fourth of March, and the following week everything went into lockdown. So we have those findings, and I went through them briefly, but I can't present them right now, but they were very stark. And the biggest thing for me was the fact that the women that took part of these surveys were women, first, second, third, fourth, fifth generation of women from the Sikh community being born and brought up in Scotland. And the things that they have said around discrimination in the workplace, around the inequalities, and what barriers they faced, and actually young women that have got degrees and know that they are capable in this job and the barriers that come in. And so for me, I think just close on what you were saying, what the Scottish Government can do, I think there needs to be recognition the fact that funding specifically for charities specialising in the BAME communities should be prioritised in a meaningful way. And I'm just, by this I mean organisations not having to continually go cap in hand to local authorities for, or government for what I believe is the right of every human being to be entitled to a service that meets their cultural specific needs. It does, the people are being referred to mainstream, mainstream. What is mainstream? They go to the mainstream services, and I'm talking about the job centres. So we're talking about employment, so I'm, I'm, I'm focusing on the job centres. Because over the past 30 years, we have done many projects, and we have linked in with local job centres and job centres across Scotland, Edinburgh. And it's the same thing. People go there, women go there, and then they are then referred back to us for that long-term support. Now, some people call it hand-holding. Some people call it whatever the different labels on it. But we then work with these individual women on a long-term basis, and we do get them into employment, and we, we, we're able to give them confidence. Now, a lot of the women from the Sikh community do not have a language problem. The language is not the problem. There are other barriers, and they're there. And sadly for me, I have been born and brought up in Scotland, and at this age, for me to actually see, see and look and see, there is there is discrimination in such a level, it's unbelievable. Now, even if we look at our local authority, we have worked with Edinburgh City Council on employment. We've held days, we've held seminars, we've worked with them to you know, provide information on how to access the um, Edinburgh City Council websites and so on for applications. But it only goes so far and then it stops. It's very, very frustrating and it feels this is where you feel like there are, the barriers have not moved. They are still there and they're not being addressed properly. Okay, thank you. That's very helpful. And I wonder if you'd be able to um, share the report that you mentioned with the committee? If yes, definitely. Thank you. Okay. Um, I said at the beginning, unfortunately, we're quite tight for time, so I'm going to move on to the next um, question, and I'll just um, make the, the request again. This is such an important topic, and it's so big, but if we can keep um, questions and answers fairly succinct, and um, as I said earlier, this isn't the only piece of work we're going to do, so we will pick up and um, probe things further as we go along. Um, Alison Harris, can I bring you in, please, Alison? Good morning, convener. Good morning, panel. Firstly, if I could just identify with the comments made by Angela Constance before she actually asked her questions at this very, very difficult time. 
panel, I would like really to ask you about the financial support. So, I would like to ask you whether your organisations have been able to access the financial support provided by the Scottish Government via the Third Sector Resilience Fund, or have they had any access to any other financial support? Thank you. Thank you. And can I come to Trishna Singh for that question, please? Um, Trishna. Thank you, Kalina. Yes, we have. We have accessed the the response resilience fund. We've just accessed the third sector fund, and we've accessed some of the other smaller pots that have become available through Interface Scotland. Um, and there was another one that I can't remember the name, but we have accessed those fundings. And I have to say that the process for those was very straightforward and simple. And it, um, it made me feel that these, the organ, the, the government, Scottish government, they actually made us feel that they have trust in our organisations, so we didn't have to go through a whole complicated process, get a small pot of money, which made a huge difference. And I think that's where Scottish government needs to acknowledge the fact that organisations that have been around and are, have mm. been sort of steeped in the community for so many years are able to take such a small amount of money and make it go so far. And, and bring it into the fact because when we look at the food banks, they were there, we have contacts with the food banks, but there was no Asian food supplies in that. And so for me, and also the fact that we, as an ordinary, a, a very small community organisation, we were not digital. We had none of our staff had laptops at home, so the Resilience Fund allowed us within ten days to be able to get laptops and have all of our staff working from home within the space of ten days. And that, but, but for me, that is something that should be looked at going forward. It should not be a snapshot. It should not be that it happened now, quick, sharp shot. And then we go back to the process of you're applying for three years funding and you're having to go through hoops when you, when people know the kind of work that you do and have been doing. And we, 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 I feel that we should be at the point of being in the mainstream, not always the third sector other. Okay. Yes, thank, thank you, Trishna. Sorry, I understand what you're saying. Sorry, convener. Um, I'll just move in on, on that question around access to the um, Third Sector Resilience Fund and any other financial support that you've been able to, to access, Kalida. Thank you, convener, and thank you, uh, Alison. The uh, Scottish Government has worked well during the pandemic with easy applications and funding available. However, they must not ignore the seriousness of the future impact for young BAME Scots with COVID-19 and what they are seeing on social media right now. Although this funding saved our charity from closing, it, it absolutely did, and we have been able to access small pots of funding. This is not, it's, it's not sustainable. And it's 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 not big enough for us to truly give that employment opportunities to our our, our BAME youth workers who are working round the clock at the moment for free, and who are also impacted by what they're seeing. This funding that we have only lasts for 12 weeks. The Scottish government must know that they face that young Black Scots um, know that they face additional um, often unforeseen challenging on the basis of colour, nationality, ethnicity and cultural and national origin. And the, what, the, who we are working with, the ambassadors, the young people, our, our youth workers who are all on zero contract hours, it's against what our ethics completely. These are role models and our future leaders. Uh, they will continue their journeys in, in efforts to dismantle racism. Thank you. Thank you. That's really helpful, Alison. I'll just, if you don't mind, uh, if you wait, I'll bring you in. I just put well, this um, wonderful format that one is not is not without its challenges. So I know it feels a bit clunky, but I'll just, um, if I can ask Michael to answer Alison's question, please, Michael. Thank you, thank you again, Convina. Um I think for us as an organisation, it's been uh, tough. It's been challenging. Uh, if I go back to the experience uh, when we started the organization, we spent the first good three years without any funding, despite the good work that we were doing and despite the recognition community of the support that we were giving to the community. And so um, after the first three years, uh, that frustration and all that, we managed to get some funding, uh, and this is before the COVID. 
uh, through the Scottish Government uh, with the uh, uh, social enterprise, uh, social innovation partnership, and partnership with the with the Hunter Foundation. But when we came to um, the the pandemic, uh, it was very challenging for us to go through that process because a uh, the funding that is provided is for short term. Now the the challenge for us as an organisation would be applying for that funding, picking up a community. Um, and supporting that community for a short period of time and then letting go. Because normally these funding cycles, especially the one for, for COVID, is a short term. Uh, we don't know what is going to happen after that. So as an organization, we couldn't, because there was no commitment of what is going to happen after the situation, we couldn't commit ourselves to the community in terms of supporting them. So what we've decided as a community as an organization is to use whatever little money that we have as an organization to then support the community, which is terrible. But I think when it comes to funding, uh, th there's a lack of trust. There's a lack of trust of what the grassroots organizations can do. Um, and, 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 and because of that, it, it becomes very challenging and very tough uh, for these organiz our organization to engage and continue to support. Now, it's well that in most cases, our services are recognized and shouted upon, and, and yes, you're doing a very good work, but it's a totally different ball game when it comes to funding. It's a totally different ball game when you start to ask for money um, to, to support your community. Uh, the, the process that you go through, the scrutiny that you go through, um, is normally not not so good and and because of this we decided not to go down the funding process um um so for us as an organization we never did that purely because we didn't want to pick up the community and then let go um after after post covid okay thank you that's um helpful um and alison are you content or do you have any follow up question no i'm content with the answers convener thank you Thank you. We'll now move on to Morris Golden. Morris. Thank you, convener. I'd just like to ask the panel, thinking about communications, how effective has communication been in terms of the information and guidance around COVID-19? Thank you. And can I come to Trishna Singh, please? Trishna. Yeah. Um, I've, I've been looking at it, and there has been some communication that's come out from the local authorities that is in different languages. But actually, looking at just this right now, um, there's a lot of confusion within the community. I'm speaking to some some of our service users. The latest thing that's come out about the phase down of some things opening and some things not. It hasn't been clear communication, and the big and the, one of the main places for getting this out are the specific radio stations and places of worship and other community hubs that are linked to the Sikh community. And people have not been getting that information. There's actually, I have, I have looked to see if there's any information in any, in any different language, and particularly in Gurmukhi, which is a Sikh written language. And there isn't anything about what's happening or what will be happening next in, in that. And so the communication is very, very sparse. And we, based in Edinburgh, are the, are, we are getting out as much information as we can to the community. But then again, we're restricted. We have a very small staff team. And like everybody else said, that some of our workers are we're all part time. So our resources are limited. And we don't have those kind of resources or that kind of infrastructure to be able to make sure that everybody is getting the correct message. So it's very confusing. And I'm, I'm, I'm very concerned about you know some of the conversations that I've been having with people just since last week, people, women saying that oh that's wonderful that means that the Gurdwara is opening and we can go and it's like no the disease is still out there and people are not, lots of people are not getting that they seem to think that the government because the government have said that you can go out and you can meet and some people are thinking that means that everything's okay. And so I think that there, there's, there need, there's a lot of work to be done in making sure that the message gets out to all of these BME communities. And I'm speaking for all the Sikh community. There's four Gurdwaras in Glasgow and there's one in Edinburgh. And I really don't think that there's been much communication with them. As I said before, I spoke to the, the president on Monday of the Edinburgh Gurdwara and he said he's had no contact 
no information, nothing on how we will proceed, you know, post lockdown or, or when, when the exit strategy comes out, what they are meant to do and what they're not meant to do. And can I just, um, I've got one point here, like the, the SEEK network, um, the SEEK Federation of UK had written to um, Fiona Hislop, the Cabinet Secretary for Economy, Fair Work and Culture, in relation to a query about what statistics are available to the SEEK community in Scotland. And her whole reply, I won't quote, but there's this bit that I found really interesting. Did ethnicity data is absent in relation to around 9% of COVID-19 related deaths, which means that this data cannot be used to draw reliable conclusions. So the Scottish government is currently looking at how under my colleague Fulton. Sorry to interrupt you. My, my colleague Fulton McGregor is going to come in and explore that very specific um, issue a little bit later. So, having had your feedback on the communication, if I can now come to Kilhida Noon and ask specifically around communication with um, young people um, from, uh, in terms of what's happening with the lockdown and, and, and COVID. Kilhida, please. Thank you for the question, Morris. Thank you, convener. The information I feel has been there. Uh, it's 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 everywhere you look. Uh, it's been given out in uh, leaflets. It's it's on the radio. It's on the TV. However, the communities that we work with don't watch the TV, don't listen to the radio, and don't read anything that comes through their door. Their only access to information is social media, and that's with, with our young people. It's been uh, we've had to do it. There is lots of good intentions out there with the larger youth services and youth organisations, but the information stays at the top. It doesn't filter down. There's no resources in place or uh, or on the agenda or the or having in their mind that there needs to be that link there. That link needs to be resourced because our young people and our communities don't access it. So partnership, collaboration, and making sure that this information that, that is staying at the top actually has, has a positive impact and is actually the resources, more resources are there for the boots that are on the ground working with these communities. Um, uh, yeah, that's that's that's, that's it. And it, it's like we don't want to constant. We don't want to just have the information that's not true, and it's um, in reinforcing and embedding a lot of inequalities for young people. Okay, thank you, Kalida. Michael, um, if I can ask you to come in on Morris's specific question about um, communication, there, please, Michael. Thank you so much, Convener. Um, I think the communication on our side has been okay. However, um, because we support people from different communities, from different backgrounds, we have to follow up uh, to, to provide clarity. Um, because uh, what sometimes, again, just like Trishna highlighted there, while you're saying to people that they can go out and meet um, a group of eight people, uh, the interpretation from to other communities could be, eight people within a family, within what family. So it's, it's providing clarity around that. And that's, that is the, the, the support that we've been providing to, to, to the community. Is in back to the different communities and try to clarify and shed more light upon what information has been provided. Um, but generally, I think the communication, the information has been good, but the, alongside the communication that has been provided, we are supporting we are providing more clarity upon what what information we get. Okay, thank you. Um, Morris, are you content with that? Those answers? Yes. Okay. In which case, I'll um, move on to Fulton McGregor. Fulton, please. Yes. Good morning, panel. Um, you know, members will be aware of the uh, report or the review report published by Public Health England this week. Which has confirmed that black, Asian and minority ethnic people in the UK are more likely than others to die with COVID. How important um, do you think that it is to have information about COVID deaths and infection rates, uh, indeed for that matter, um, broken down by ethnicity? And what do you think your organisations 
and the government can do with that information. Thank you. Thank um, you. And Krishna, if I can bring you in on, on that, I know you, please, Krishna. Um, thank you, Kamina. Oh, as an organisation, we, we don't deal with those kind of statistics at the present moment, so for us it would be very it would be good to have those inf that information. But in Scotland currently, there isn't anything, there isn't any way that we can find out that information. There has been, you know, discussion at the, through in Glasgow, the Gurdwaras have come together, but the SEAT network, UK SEAT network, conducted a survey after the government published its COVID-19 recovery strategy on, in, on May 2020, and that survey had 1,553 responses. 27 of those were from Scotland. And just some of the findings that 98% of all the respondents were extremely unhappy that the government did not consult Sikh organisations working with Gurdwaras, forcing them to close their doors to the public. Now, they don't, the, 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 the other 96% said that they were very concerned with the high proportion of Sikh deaths from COVID. Now, other data have been collected locally from Gurdwaras and Sikh funeral directors by the Sikh network. Now, these Sikh funeral directors are mainly in England. We don't have any Sikh funeral directors in Scotland. So, the first COVID deaths were reported, the Sikh deaths were reported in March 2020. And, they, 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 and according to their survey, it's approximately twice the national average. And this, again, has been mainly reported in England. So we, we have no way of, in Scotland of gathering that kind of information. The only way would be from going to see good for us in Glasgow. In Edinburgh, fortunately, we haven't heard of anything. There has been no deaths linked to the COVID within the Sikh community in Edinburgh as of yet, and we hope there aren't. But in Glasgow, even just as recently as last week, I, I was informed from a very close friend of her sister who has died from COVID, and she was in a care home. Now, there's in, in Glasgow, there's a larger Sikh community, and the population is larger. There are people in care homes, but we don't know how their, their ethnicity is being gathered and what information is being gathered, or even if people know that um, this is this is happening. I mean, the race equality framework for Scotland expressly states public authorities in Scotland monitor and use ethnic data in formulating policies and developing practices. Now, the Sikh Federation has the data collected and used by individual NHS bodies in Scotland, and data on religion is con consistently incomplete and of poor quality compared to ethnicity data. So the, the thing that's highlighted here is ethnicity data, as opposed to religious data, is more commonly used in NHS Scotland. But we don't have an ethnicity box that people tick. It's a religious seat comes under the religious one. So we will it's it's very, very difficult and it's really hard. So all of this information coming out is actually coming and being gathered by the seat council in, in the seat council UK and they're all based in English. The Sikh Federation is based in England. The Sikh Network is based in England. And they are the ones that are conducting all of these these surveys and pulling them together and then making contact with us to let us know. I mean, it's it's quite stark. And, and it's, it's very worrying to think that, as I said earlier, that there's been a Sikh community in Scotland for over 80 years. And we're at this stage where such a pandemic, a pandemic has occurred and we do not even know how many Sikh people have died or are being affected by it. Thank and you, that Trishna. is a very concern. Thank you. Trishna, would you be willing to provide um, the committee with a copy of that letter from the Cabinet Secretary so that we can... Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Khalida, can I bring you in on um, Fulton's question, please? Khalida. Thank you. I, I lost connection, so I didn't get the question. So, I'll, I, in, in, in essence, um, how important is it to have information on um, COVID-19 deaths broken down by ethnicity and um, how would that help you? What, you know, what would your organisation do with that uh, information? Thank you, Fulton. Um, the, the, the information that's, that's there, you know, a lot of young people are seeing it out there already, um, and it would be good to get the real statistics um, that that affect these communities. So, and but 
resourcing for us to be able to um, to take that to our young people. You know, the, the mental, we have to consider mental health um, with these statistics. You know, many BAME communities, mental health problems are rarely spoken about and they're seen negatively. You know, the anxieties are, are high for families in low paid jobs and the, the, these statistics are just adding even more pressure and the the fact that we're, they're not hearing about it, everybody's going, where's the statistics? Why are we not hearing about it? And this together with what the the, the murders of innocent black people, it's it's really, we're really in a, a crisis, a critical point with with our young people and um, with with their their ability to, to be socially included and to be um, really uh, active in their communities. Thank you. Um, Michael, can I bring you in on Fulton's uh, question, please, Michael? Thank you so much, Convina. Um I think uh, the data is very important, and the report that was released uh, uh, down south um, is a very good report. The challenge is normally when this information is released, it's always focused on down south, on London. And I think the Scottish government needs to do its own report based on what is in Scotland. And, and because of that, we find that the reports are done um, down south and it's left to people down south to deal with it. And, and, and often I think that's how Scotland gets away with some of these issues. Um, that's, that's a long time for Scotland to address some of these issues. So the data is important. Uh, the report is very, very good, um, but often when it comes to out working and, 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 and applying the recommendations, again, it will be left to what is happening down there rather than what we can do in Scotland. Um, we recently, in March, actually, we we're talking about employability, employability and all that. We, we did a research uh, on employability. I'm sorry to take you back. And we sent it out to the Scottish government and all that. And all you get is that generic email of yes we are doing we are committed to doing a b c d and and you're saying yes you are committed but there are still some gaps um and so i think it's important for scotland to concentrate on what is happening in scotland and react and respond to what is in scotland other than depending on what is in london and leaving it to london or okay Britain, England. thank you i think that's a very helpful comment for for accountability, we need to know exactly what's happening here. Um, can I bring in, we're coming into the last sort of um, eight minutes of, of the session. Can I bring in Pauline McNeil, please, Pauline? Thank you very much, convener. Um, I really just wanted to go back to um, what Khalida had said quite a while ago, actually, now, but it, you were talking about um, teachers not following the procedure and the black young people were fearful of the police figures, uh, so, uh, fearful of the police. And so my first question was, do you have any figures that you could share with the committee around that? And just lastly, um, so you're talking about um, uh, police murders and the fact that you know black young people are seeing this. And I just wondered on that particular statement, uh, could you just, uh, clarify with the committee, what were you talking about there? Were you talking about the scenes that in the US, uh, UK-wide, or is it specific to Scotland? I'm quite keen to know the answer to that question, just because um, obviously um, we're having to kind of refresh, uh, I think, our approach, um, given the response in the Black Lives Matter campaign. So I'm particularly keen to, and, and if you can't share that with us today, um, it would be really great if you could share that with the committee. I know we're short of time. Okay. Um, but bring in Kalida on that. I suppose today we're trying to, um, and I hate, I feel like I'm stopping people speaking here, and that's not something I ever want to do. But I suppose what's helpful for today for this session is to, is to focus on the, the the COVID inquiry that we're doing, but also. Um, the committee would absolutely, absolutely want to hear from your organisation on these other things, so it's possible to follow up. And can I, before I bring you in, just apologise. They began drilling the street outside my house, so sorry if that sound is. Across. It's, it's adding to the relaxing ambience of this meeting. 
have to say. Um, to lead up, I can bring you in. Thank, thank you, convener. Um, thanks. Uh, um, so, to answer the question, um, police, uh, the, the young people already from the, the, these communities do not go to the police for anything, even if there's violence in the home, violence with their peers, they will never reach out to the police. They deal with it themselves. There's no trust there. What they see, even before everything, is, is police brutality and murders. With regards to COVID-19 and the, the young people, at the moment, there's, there's evidence out there that if you're a young black person, young BAMES person, you're more likely to be stopped, fined. Um, the, and the, um, so, so that's the police. We, we're, the COVID-19 um, report that we're doing right now, that's, the statistics will be in there with regards to what young people in Scotland feel. Um, with regards to the, the, the teachers, and I think if I hear you right, it's about not dealing was it was the question about not dealing with spaces? I'm sorry. Let me just add um, this. Uh, Pauline, can you can you just um, refresh um, our, sure, our memory? Yeah, to... sorry. Um, yeah, it's just that you spoke for quite a while about this. Apologies to the convener. Yeah. And, um, yeah. Said that teachers were not following procedures, and and I just oh. wondered procedures you were talking about. Yeah. So basically. Thank, you. thank you. So basically, in the in our insight report, it's got a real in depth about teachers not having the right um, training, the right skills, or sometimes the whole bias of of not truly understanding that it's not racist bullying. It's racist. It's racist attacks and racist incidents. For example, one young person. Who are even more than plenty of young people who are are informing teachers about racism and about attacks that they're, that's happening, and teachers don't respond to it effectively. And actually, the the young person, the gaslighting effect happens, and the young person who reports the the racist incidents is actually the one that gets suspended. We've got two case studies on that. Um, every, everything's on our, our web. We've got two, uh, one case study on our website that you can see, and it's just they're not adequately trained or have the have the desire to truly support that young person. Are are kind of an ask, following the right procedures to be kind to, and looking at that young person as a victim because they don't they don't look at them. Many don't look at them as a, a, a victim and. It, it gets brushed under the carpet to, time and time again, and we've been campaigning for this for absolutely years with Trishna as well, with Sikh and Jog. We've been campaigning for this for absolutely years, and it's not until a murder of a black person that everybody now wants to work in partnership with you. We've been talking about this for years, and it has to be followed through. And because it's understanding the being able to understand the correct procedures in dealing with racism in schools is it doesn't take that much effort and it actually makes a massive huge impact life changing moment for that young person who's the victim of racism thank you sorry got passionate and it's and you're right to be and I welcome your passion and your knowledge and expertise um, I wonder if, and apologies to keep asking, I, I, I know that committee members will have had sight of, of many of the reports that, that you have spoken about, and certainly I've, I've um, looked on social media for your for your organisation and saw a wonderful um, article from your anti-racist ambassadors um, yesterday. If you could share them with the committee, and even if it's not for this bit of work, we will pick it up in the future. Um, we're coming to the end of the and, um, Briefly for, for a couple of seconds, Kalida. Just to clarify on the question there about the the what they're seeing, it's it's not just the US. Um, Scotland is not innocent. There's there's a lot of video footage of young black people getting um, 
getting treated differently than their white counterparts. Um, the, the scenes are in US, of course, but there's many scenes of police brutality in the UK and the, the, in, in Scotland as well of young people of colour getting targeted and not having the same experiences, positive experience with the police force. Thank you for that. Um, that unfortunately um, completes our questions for our first panel. Um, I think today, more than any other, been acutely aware of the, the constraints we've had around time. So I would invite um, uh, Trishna, Khalida, Michael, if there's anything that we didn't ask you or anything you didn't get the chance to say, um, please do email in, in to us and, and we will pick it up. And as I say, this is not a, a one off event for us. Um, so thank you very much for your for your time and um, your expertise. And if I ask you to wait for um, broadcasting to switch off your video and microphone, and you're of course free to leave the meeting or you can continue to watch on Scottish Parliament TV if you want. And we will briefly suspend while broadcasting set up panel two. Thank you. Welcome back, everybody, and good morning to our um, second panel of the day. I'd like to repeat my thanks for um, to the witnesses for being with us this morning. I'm really grateful for you finding the time to answer questions from from the committee today. Um, for the benefit of witnesses, I'll just repeat how the session will work, and um, benefit of members as well, I suppose. Um, because of the challenges in managing a virtual meeting, we're taking the questions um, in a pre-arranged order. I will invite members to ask questions, then invite witnesses to respond, also in a pre-arranged order. And then I will go back to members for any follow-up questions. Um, once completed, I will invite the next, next questioner and so on until the evidence session is concluded. We have one hour um, for this evidence session this morning. Um, and I would ask um, that questions and answers were succinct, please. If you give broadcasting staff a few seconds to operate your microphones before beginning to ask your question or provide an answer, and please wait for me to um, say your name before coming in on your question or answer. So this morning, can I um, welcome witnesses on our second panel? Lynn Tammy, Interim National Coordinator, Article 12 in Scotland, Suzanne Munday, Gypsy Traveller Programme Manager. MECOP and Clear Through Policy and Impact Manager, Homeless Network Scotland. Thank you for being with us this morning. You're all very welcome. Um, and if I can start the questions by asking for um, some feedback from you on how the communities that you provide services to have been affected um, specifically by the pandemic and the lockdown measures that have been put in place. And if I could come to Lynn Tammy first, please, Lynn. Good morning. Um, thanks for inviting me along to speak today. Um, just a quick intro to what Article 12 in Scotland does. Um, we work in the main with young people to empower them to promote and, and enjoy their human rights. And part of that work and a, a, a focus at this point in time is young gypsy travellers. And that's around enabling them to build their capacity and social capital. And a necessary part of this is access to learning and development. Um, like the previous speakers, and I'm sure like everybody else that's going to speak now, um, COVID-19 really has impacted on uh, the work that we do. Um, the, the main focus for us has been that we've had to shift our learning and development online. And this for us is, is you know, it's been, it's, it's been a, a, a Deep learning curve for us as workers, as well as the young people, um, it's a it's it's a completely different game to be trying to to connect and and encourage learning and development um, through through um, online platforms. And the biggest issue that's come up, and I'm sure that everybody's already aware of this, and 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 it also doesn't it's it's not just an issue for young gypsy travellers, is a lack of access to to resources. That enables online learning. Um, what we've been providing to a core group of young people that we already were working with is um, access to Chromebooks, um, access to stationary packs, um, and as importantly, data sims. 
because I think there's a there's an understanding or a misunderstanding that in general most families or all families have some sort of access to the internet, whether that's via data on, on smartphones or tablets or laptops. It's certainly not the case with young gypsy travellers. And stats that um, from reports across from across the UK are looking at about at least 50% of gypsy traveller families don't have access to the internet. It's much higher than that when it comes to access to devices. Um, that in itself presents a huge problem because we are working with young people who have, have never had sight of a laptop or a PC. So they don't understand how a keyboard works. They don't. There's there's no even an understanding of what. The at symbol is, or so to get young people ready to re-engage with their learning, there has been a huge amount of time and labour, if you like, having had to have gone into that. Now, fortunately for Article 12, the majority of our workforce um, are tech savvy, so we've been able to spend a lot of time with these young people. But this in itself has been extremely intensive. As an example. One worker spent six hours with a young person explaining how a keyboard operates and you know how and how to access the internet. And this was before the young person could then even become familiar and confident and feel safe to use that platform. Um, funding is huge here. We've been able to access um, additional uh, emergency funding from the Scottish government. Pause you there, Lynn, because one of my, one of my yeah. colleagues will come in and probe that a, a bit deeper. Um, yeah. If I can go to um, Suzanne Monday now, just with that general question about how COVID nineteen and the um, lockdown measures are impacting the, the the folk that you work with, please, Suzanne. Thank you, convener, for the question. Um, so um, I think the first point to make is that. In addition to targeting a lot of our resources and efforts to supporting the community during COVID-19, we've also had to balance that with our ongoing work because we support carers and cared for people within the community. Those issues do not go away, and we know that carers have particular concerns about their situation um, during um, the pandemic. So, um, in addition to echoing what Lynn has already said, I think the primary issues that we've come across with the community are the impact on household income for people, um, and particularly um, the impact of the um, pandemic on gypsy traveller men who are unable to travel and unable to work. A lot of them are sole traders, and, and that's had a huge impact on overall household income. Um, we've also seen um, mental health um, coming to the fore as a, a real issue. And again, I think particularly since this would be the traditional shifting season when people are able to travel, the inability to stay, well, the, the, the fact that people have to stay put has had um, a significant impact on mental health. And we already know that there are, you know, considerable levels of depression, stress, and anxiety generally. So this has come on top of that. Um, I think access to information ha has been um, a challenge. Um, and again, echoing what Lynn says around perhaps um, a reliance on digital literacy is one of the main forms. And again, not everybody is connected, has access to IT equipment, etc. And then I think um, the long-standing issue of um, sufficient site accommodation for gypsy traveller communities is an ongoing challenge um, as well. So those, I would say, are the main issues. Thank you. That's helpful. Claire Frew, can I ask um, you the same question, please, Claire? Absolutely. Thank you, convener, and thanks to all other panel members uh, that we're learning a lot from by listening in this morning. Um, I'll aim to make a few introductory comments, and I'm sure we'll pick up on specifics as we go. Um, so, as a homelessness organisation, we've always been really clear um, about the importance of a safe, secure home for everyone, and the current pandemic has simply reinforced this. Um, but many people experiencing homelessness in Scotland either had no accommodation at all when the pandemic hit, 
or the accommodation they did have was congregate in nature. Um, by that we mean hostels, where some of a lot of the what in there is shared. Um, a lot of people were sleeping in night shelters, which would be effectively be a mattress on the floor with 20, 30, 40 other people, um, which begs the immediate question, how does somebody shield? How does somebody self-isolate? How does somebody social distance? So this became our immediate priority uh, for local authorities all across Scotland, um, and that was the immediate challenge um, and responses were put in place to that, um, which we can talk a bit more about. And that they have been in the short term have been um, they've been really effective um, in trying to reduce some of the impacts of that. Um, so that's been really important. Um, I would add at this point as well um, that the link between homelessness and poverty. Is very, very well evidenced, and we know for a fact that the single biggest risk factor for homelessness in Scotland is poverty. Um, so, the economic impact of the coronavirus today and in the future um, is really, really important for us to consider. Um, we need to consider. Um, we have again put in place things like a pause on evictions, but we can talk a bit more about that as well. So we can we can have that. Um, we also need to lose sight of the fact that the homeless population is not. Just one massive population. Um, we need to take account of um, issues affecting women experiencing domestic abuse, um, people with no recourse to public funds, um, tensions at home for young LGBT, you know, people in our population who maybe the lockdown has been particularly difficult. Um, and I would add as a final um, comment there that the pandemic has forced big action, um, and as a sector, we're already trying to look at the future to make sure we don't lose any of the progress we've made, and we're happy to share some of that. Thank you. Thank you. That's that's really helpful. Um, I'll now bring in colleagues. If I can go to Angela Constance, please, Angela. Thank you, convener, and hello to the panel. Um, I would like to ask um, Lynn and Suzanne um, a question about the impact of COVID specifically on the gypsy traveller community. And I know. Uh, Alison Harris is going to follow up with some other questions about funding and other matters too. Um, COSLA and the Scottish Government uh, published a, a framework for decision making uh, to help inform anybody who's working with the Gypsy Traveller community, whether it's police, whether it's site managers, whether it's health, whether it's local authority services. And I would really like to know. Um, how you think that's going? You know, uh, you know, is the framework, you know, working well um, operationally, and in particular around social care services as well. Given that the gypsy traveller community um, have higher rates of ill health as well. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. Um, Lynn Tammy, if I could bring you in first, please, Lynn. Um, I'll, I'll leave the, the, the discussion around social care to Suzanne, as she is much more experienced in, in that regard than I am. Um, Suzanne and myself were part of building this new framework and ongoing work. We've been working closely with Scottish Government, COSLA, and other um, civil society organisations in this. And um, to be fair, there has been great efforts by all, including lo some some local authorities, to, to ensure that the basic fundamental services that gypsy travellers need around sanitation, access to clean water, um, access to a place to call home. We all really need that in these times. Um, there have been areas where this where it's not been as efficient as it could have been. Um, my own thinking around this it goes back to historical methods of operating in local authorities. The ones that do have gypsy traveller liaison officers, GTLOs, and have a commitment from um, elected representatives um, would seem to have been quick, quicker off the mark, if you like, than other ones. But in fairness, I would say that all local authorities have shown an interest and shown a keenness and a commitment to ensure that the community's needs are met on a basis of equity with members of the settled community. Thank you, Lynn. I can bring in Suzanne Monday now, please. Suzanne. Thank you, convener. Um, 
Okay, so specifically on social health, um, Gypsy Traveller community have historically, I think, been distanced from a lot of mainstream services, and that does include social work and social care. Um, and it continues to be the case that um, the vast amount of informal care as a key component of social care is delivered by family members and wider community networks. So a lot of our focus has been on supporting the informal carers that we are in touch with. And we've done that through regular telephone welfare calls um, by my team. So we're currently supporting in excess of 100 people. Through those telephone calls, we are able to you know, provide support, give information, reassurance, etc. But there have been some specific examples. So where um, Gypsy Travellers are linked into formal social care services, I'm thinking particularly funding services, funded services and self-directed support, there's been a preference for people to have a direct payment to employ a personal assistant. Now, obviously, with um, restrictions on people coming into the home, the lockdown, etc., that has had an impact on, on the continuity of that service. So what we have found is that carers um, are having to take up um, even more care for the individual than they were previously due to the withdrawal or reduction of services. So that's been one issue that um, is, is coming to, to prominence. And I think as a result of that, we are seeing, again, as I said previously, um, a real impact on people's mental health. And um, again, not being able to access um, counseling services that they were previously in, in touch with, and whether it's delays in waiting for referrals and appointments um, with community psychiat psychiatric nurses, um, psychiatrists, etc. So again, we're finding that people are having to struggle on their own for, for longer. Okay. Thank you. Angela, do you have any follow-up questions? No, no, not at this stage, convener. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if I can bring in Alison Harris now, please. Alison. Morning, panel. Could I ask whether your organisations have been able to access the financial support provided by the Scottish Government? If I can go to Lynn Tammy first. Lynn. Um, I did touch on this earlier. Um, we have been able to. We already receive a, a, a pot of funding from the Scottish Government Equality Unit Department. Um, we were able to access some emergency funding um, from them to increase the hours of our um, workforce that are, are, are um, engaged in the young people in learning and development programmes. Um, we were also offered. We were approached by some um, funders. Um, if, to, to apply, if you like, um, for additional funding for resources. So these were quick turnaround, somewhere within a couple of days. So we opted to go for them as opposed to applying to, to the larger funding pots. Thank you. And um, same question to Suzanne. Wendy, please, Suzanne. Yeah. Um, thank you, Kavi. I'd also like to, to echo what um, Lynn has. Said. And, and, and just to commend the Scottish Government for making the process very simple and quick. And we were able to both access additional resources to set up a financial resilience service for gypsy traveller carers, I'm sorry, gypsy traveller communities in Scotland, and also a telephone support line in recognition of the additional mental health pressures. Um, we were also given flexibility to use our existing funding um, to target that more um, in a more concentrated way to supporting the, the community through the pandemic. So, so yes, we have been able to access it. And more widely, we've been able, you know, we, we were very lucky to receive um, a donation from a previous charitable funder for our work as well. So, so, so yes, <laughs> is the answer. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, Claire Fru, um, has your organisation been able to um, access the, the financial support that's been made available? 
Um, I think probably the first thing to say, we've been very lucky to work with a lot of very supportive funders through this time, which has been fantastic. In terms of money made available by the Scottish Government, um, we weren't seeking any funds for anything, any work we were doing. Um, but what we did do was we accessed um, the third sector funds um, that was delivered through SCBO, um, and we got quick access to that. And we set up what we called a staying in fund, and it was for people who are currently homeless. It was recognising that a lot of efforts already put in. Um, picking up people's prescriptions for people, getting them food packages and all that kind of stuff. But actually, people just lacked money, immediate access to money. So um, through that fund, we were able to offer £100 um, to people through this process. And actually, uh, the applications came in thick and fast. Um, it's right, but we had that. We accessed £100,000 for that to offer just an immediate access to cash or, or, or vouchers for people to get them through that. So that's been a really uh, positive uh, experience for us, I think. OK, thank you. Alison, are, are you content or do you have a follow up question? Well, I've got a different question, convener, if oh. I could move on to that, please. Oh. Really directed to Suzanne Mundy. And I would be interested to know if you're aware of any gypsy travellers that have been unfairly accused of ignoring social distancing measures? That's, um, um, yes, thank you. Thank you, Alison, for the question. Um, that's an interesting question. I think what we have noticed is, um, as a result, we think particularly of um, a programme that was aired by, by Channel 4, which did focus on the gypsy traveller community in, in England. There was almost a, a heightened, more general awareness, I think, which impacted um, negatively on the community. And I think just recently, we are aware of small um, numbers of gypsy travellers who are starting to move um, and have been picking up reports that, um, you know, social distancing um, perhaps hasn't been as adhered to as, as we would like. I, I don't know if Lynn would want to come in on that and say anything. Lynn. Thank you. Um, I, I think there's different perceptions and misunderstandings of, firstly, how the, the, the community lives when they're shifting, moving around, or indeed on permanent um, sites. Because when we're talking about a household for gypsy travellers, we're generally speaking about a substantial number of people that form an extended family. So, if you were to see three or four trailers vans being towed, you would then perhaps think that that was people travelling together who were not from the same household and were therefore not practising appropriate social distancing. Um, so, I think it's about being aware of that. It's you know when when members of the settled community, if they do see that. That just to take cognizance of is that you know there's 99 percent sure that this is one household, but this is how they're moving around. Um, I haven't, we haven't had anybody contacting us and and reporting that the community were not practicing um, good social distancing techniques. Thank you. That's helpful. And if I can move on to um, Morris Golden, please, Morris. Thank you, Convener. Um, my question is mainly for uh, Claire and the Homelessness Network. Um, obviously, you, in your earlier remarks, you mentioned um, some issues in terms of uh, shielded groups and being in a night shelter. I wondered uh, overall how you think uh, there, if there has been appropriate action in terms of providing accommodation and if there's any uh, geographical uh, disparity within that clear thank you that's a, that's a really important question um, and I think it was our immediate challenge uh, that we faced um, was was how to put those things in, in place um, and between uh, 
national and local government, um, there was significant funding put in straight away um, to make use of empty hotel rooms across the country. Now, initially, this was um, from the Scottish government perspective, was largely in Glasgow and Edinburgh because that's where you'll tend to find uh, more rough sleepers. Um, but local authorities all across the country um, were trying to take advantage of the fact. Uh, that nobody was staying in, in any hotels to use that um, to literally either get people off the streets and also to reduce the capacity in some of our bigger accommodation projects just to disperse people. Um, and I think it's really important to note that um, that intervention in itself um, has meant that rough sleeping is almost now non existent on the streets of Scotland as a result of that intervention. Now, what's there is temporary. Um, we've taken, but we have taken a massive, massive step forward. Um, and you can never put numbers on these things because they change every day. Um, but one of the latest estimates we heard across the country is that there was less than 30 people who were uh, potentially uh, sleeping rough, and even taking Glasgow and Edinburgh numbers um, here and in Glasgow, that could be down to single figures, um, which is which just shows you what you can do. Um, with a massive intervention and just put the urgency behind it. Um, so, in terms of that, so what we what we have managed to do um, is take a lot of that pressure off for now. Um, but what comes next? That's the big question. Is we've made massive progress in a very short period of time, and the the focus now is we can't lose it. That we cannot lose the progress that we've made. Um, but if you were to walk the streets of cities now, you will see almost nobody. Uh, sleeping on the streets, which is it, it's been quite an achievement. So I would say for local and national government, for third sector organisations, housing associations, but massive credit to everyone who got in and made that happen. Thank you, Morris. Uh, that's uh, heartening to hear. Um, we passed uh, legislation in the Scottish Parliament around extending the notice for evictions, and I'm wondering. From your perspective, Claire, uh, are you seeing anyone presenting um, uh, of, of losing their home as a result of what would be effectively illegal ev evictions? Claire, again, that's another really excellent question. The pause on evictions for six months in a lot of cases, three months and in, in, in some others, it has been it's been a very very welcome um, a very welcome step. Um, I think what we I think what we've probably heard or seen little bits of was maybe a bit of confusion for some for some eviction proceedings that were in the works prior to the new legislation, and maybe a bit of confusion in the early days about whether the legislation covered them or didn't because it was already being uh, enacted. Um, but other than that, um, we're we're not seeing we're not seeing people um, as far as, as as for anything feedback we've had at all. We're not seeing people come into the homelessness system. Um, as a result of uh, any evictions uh, being carried out, that's not to say people um, are are not being impacted by that. But as far as far as we're aware, um, that is holding um, for the for the next few months, um, which is uh, really um, again it, it's really heartening. Thank you. And if I can um, move on to Fulton McGregor now, please, Fulton. Um, thank you, convener, and hey, good morning, panel. I uh, suppose I just get a general um, question for um, each of the panel members. I suppose asking what your main concerns are for the individuals and communities that you work with, both just now as we are in phase one of easing the restrictions, and as we move through um, the, the phases with the various caveats uh, around uh, around um, infection rates. What, what what would be the main concerns that you've got going forward? Thank you. If I can come to Lynn Tammy first, please. Lynn. Um, just reflecting on what Suzanne had mentioned earlier, also is is around um, issues around income, family income. Um, people have been locked down for several weeks now. Traveller farms mean or are using benefits. So there has been an issue around that and a concern, um, and it has been raised as well by families um, to us, is that families are, are feeling a real need now 
to be out and engaging in work. Now, this is, as we all know, this is acceptable um, in certain areas, provided that people are washing their hands, they have all the facilities there, um, to meet and social distancing, of course. Um, and, and perhaps what's positive for the community is many are sole workers, lone workers, so that makes that a bit easier. But it's about getting the information out to the community what the stages are and what can be done, what can't be done, what's appropriate, what's not appropriate. But I'm feeling that there might be another question about information coming, so I'll, I'll stop at that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. If I can ask um, Suzanne Monday to comment on Fulton McGregor's question. Uh, Suzanne. Thank you, Fulton, for the question. Can I just take two seconds to go back a little bit and just to say that with regard to um, incidences of social distancing, I would just like to clarify that the vast and overwhelming majority of the community are maintaining social distancing and have been very strict about it. So just so that that's there. Um, in terms of main concerns going forward, again, I, I, I would echo um, the a focus on um, household income and clarity around what is and isn't possible in terms of movement, particularly for, for men to be able to engage in work. And I think also going forward in more the medium to longer term, you know, not, not losing the, the, the progress that, that we have made because um, th there has been a significant amount of joint working that you know, loads of agencies have pulled together to support the community, and, and it's about how we consolidate and build and maintain that, I think, going forward into phases two, three, and four of the lockdown. Thank you. That's helpful. Claire Fru, can I bring you in now, please, Claire? Sure. Um, I think I would like to come at this maybe from some of the lifting of restrictions for um, for, for staff, is obviously affecting all of us, but I suppose some of our thinking around about this is about um, the delivery of services for people who are homeless and, and how we how we continue to work uh, alongside people. Um, and while I described quite a lot about these incredible temporary and emergency solutions we've found, um, one of the big issues we continue to face is that there's been restrictions on staff having to work remotely. Staff working from home, um, which is which has meant that um, we've not been able to have housing allocations as you normally would do. A lot of that pretty much ground to a halt. Some of that because you know staffing issues in local authorities, housing associations, uh, but also repairs, uh, utilities, all the things people not working. Um, so I think it's important to note at this point then, that what we've had is. Yes, we put in place something better than might have been there before, but, but there are a lot of people who are still um, locked down in what might be really quite unsuitable accommodation, uh, as, as you know, we would view that. So I think what's really important for us is, as the lockdown lifts, is that we can get much more quickly back to be able to let permanent homes to people, um, because we're now going to create this backlog of people who are in this temporary situation, uh, and almost nobody's getting out of that uh, because of the lockdown restrictions. Um, so I think our big concern is about making sure we can get back to people being able to move into their own homes because we are potentially storing up, having solved one problem, we're potentially storing up another. Um, so I would just offer that as a reflection. That's that's helpful. Thank you. Fulton. Um happy enough with that, I just wanted to um ask a follow up question about the, the, the messaging uh, as we move through the phases because it's it, it strikes me that various um, or organisations would, would want to message in different ways, uh, and I've seen a really good graphic that was done by NLC um, Communications Friendly, which was showing what you can do in phase one. Um, is it, have you got any suggestions or ideas of how the Scottish Government could um, deliver the message in, in moving through the various phases for um, each of the groups of, of in communities that you work with? Yeah, if I bring Lynn Tammy in, please, Lynn. Thank you. Um, just maybe it would be a good idea to give a quick um, introduction to what we have been doing in terms of the Gypsy Traveller community. Um, we have been working with uh, MECOP, Suzanne, there on this, and the Scottish Government, COSLA, 
um, the NHS and um, Scottish Traveller Education Programme um, to produce um, online or social media messages. And the main thing that we produced was a Facebook page. Article 12 is, is uh, facilitating that and monitoring it, and so that is one point. It takes a lot of work to get it up and running, and it obviously needs to be um, kept up to date and monitored. But um, we set that up in March, and since then we've had um, we've had a reach of over 80,000. So it's clearly getting out to the community. Um, we've had a lot of positive feedback on it. We just recently did a bit of evaluation with some community members. Um, we engaged a graphic artist to infographics for us to get messages out in a clear, accessible and quick way. As importantly, we have been making videos to address literacy issues. We have had community members making videos on key points, and that again has proved successful. And in fact, videos are, as a video goes up, within a couple of hours, it's had um, six thousand upwards of six thousand uh, hits. Um, you know, so so this is the, your evidence is there. And again, we know that not all the community are literate. They don't all have access to the internet. A lot of information, especially with older members of the community, is spread by word of mouth. So the younger ones and those that are on the internet are sharing that information. Although you know, social media isn't it. It's not the only way, but it's certainly working for us. Thank you. That's really helpful and some good. Um concrete examples of, of inclusive communication there. Um, Suzanne Mundy, do you have anything to add to that? No. Thank you, convener. Yeah, I would also say that um, the way that we get information out to the com community also has two additional um, elements. One is um, through our workers who are in regular contact with um, a, a large number of individuals. So making sure that my team have access to accurate, up-to-date, timely information at which they're then able to share with the community is has been proving really effective. And secondly, we're, we're cascading information through um, people that we've identified within the community. So again, I'm in contact with community members who are more linked into to what is going on, perhaps at a policy level and various you know, things that are going on with government. So by sharing information with them, like Lynn says, through word of mouth, they're then able to take that into the community as well. So absolutely, Facebook's been fantastic. The videos have, have been amazing, and it's very much by the community, for the community, but those two additional routes as well. Thank you. That's helpful. Claire Frew, do you have anything you wish to um, reflect on and around communication of, of messaging? Claire. I wouldn't add too much at all. I would echo, I would echo uh, what both my colleagues have said uh, there, um, and particularly uh, Suzanne's point about the fact that volunteers and frontline staff are often the messengers of the information. So if we can make sure that they are clear and we take real time to make sure they know what they need to know, then that will really that will really help. Thank you. Um, moving on, if I can bring in Pauline McNeil now, please, Pauline. Thank you, convener. Um, it was just like a couple of questions I wanted to ask Claire. Um, you said that there was no housing allocations, and I just wondered if you could confirm that that's across the board. Um, and also, um, given the arrangements, as you said, uh, we've managed to. Um, resolve rough sleeping, um, and that's been positive. Have you any information at all on how that has protected the um, homeless or homeless community from COVID itself? Um, I mean, I have had a lot of MSPs have had letters about concerns about not being able to social distance in hotels, um, but I haven't had any uh, anything further to that as to whether or not it has caused actual problems. So any information on those two points would be really helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll do my best to, to pick up on both of them. Firstly, on the housing allocations uh, point, um, there has been some allocations happening, small numbers. So some local authorities maintained allocations. Um, largely to homeless households to try and reduce the backlog, um, but not everybody has been able to do that. I say some of that has been because of utilities issues and repairs issues of not being able to get staff to go and do that kind of work. Again, a lot of housing associations have paused 
their evic- sorry, their, their allocations processes for those same reasons. So there, there has been some, but nowhere near as much as you would normally get, which means that, but so largely, um, that has, that has almost ground to a halt. Um, there has been guidance from the Scottish Government, um, and the work from the Social Housing Resilience Group. Um, to look at how we can get that back up and running safely, and that's a massive priority uh, for everyone. Um, on the second question, um, again, yes, um, I'm sure there will be, from, from our perspective, or certainly from what we've we've heard, um, there will be individual cases for sure where things have been difficult, uh, either in the existing accommodation for people or in the hotel. Um, you know, um, so you'll definitely hear some of those individual stories. But we do know that the organisations on site have been working really, really hard to try and make it as safe for people as possible. And if any concerns have been raised to them, then they've been working hard to resolve them on an individual basis. But we've certainly not heard of anything on mass because we've been trying hard to um, keep people as, as, as far apart from each other as they can and provide what they need uh, within there. But I'm sure there will have been cases um, that you've all heard of through your constituency offices, um, but hopefully they are the minority. Pauline. Thank you. Thank you. Are you content, Pauline? Okay. Um, well, if, if I may um, come in, I think um, this morning we've heard about different and new ways of working. We've heard about urgency to get stuff fixed and it and it becoming fixed, the reduction in rough sleepers, for, it, for example. Um, I was also interested in comments, and forgive me, it may have come from the, the, the first panel as, as, as well as the second panel, around the applications for funding seeming to place more trust in organisations, being a bit more straightforward to, to complete and easier to access. So my question is, what do we need to do to make sure we, we hold on to these gains in better ways of working and in, in, in directing resource? Um, Suzanne Mundy, I'll come to you first, please. Suzanne. Thank you, convener. Thank you, convener. Um, I think, um, in some ways, the the organisation that I work for is, um, you know, in um, almost like a relatively privileged position because we have a long-standing and very effective working relationship with the Scottish Government. I think what has been different this time, though, is the number of organisations that have come together. Um, through, I think, what is now called the Gypsy Traveller Impact Group. Um, and we've been able to bring individual resources um, to a collective way of working um, to maximise our impact. And I think that has been really, really effective. And I think part of that has also been, you know, where perhaps organisations hadn't worked with each other that closely in the past, um, for various reasons, that those networks are now established, um, and I think those will continue going forward. But it doesn't take away from the fact that you know additional resources will be needed because once the immediate crisis is over, there are still going to be medium and longer term issues that need to be addressed through resourcing. Thank you. Um, and Lynn Tammy, do you have um, any reflections on, on those points about the, the changes that we've managed to make under crisis um, conditions and how we sustain the good, the good work that's happened? Lynn. Thank you. Really echoing what Suzanne has already mm-hmm. said, and we have found it particularly useful to be working in collaboration with our colleagues in the other NGOs and civil society organisations. We come together now and again, and at certain points, generally, um, I think it's important just to say today that this, we're in Gypsy Roma Traveller History Month, and so we always come together on that. Um, but this has really consolidated our ability and willingness to collaborate, to, because we're all working towards the same aim of improving life. For, for the Gypsy Traveller community, um, but also just to add that additional resources and ongoing resources are going to be critical to this because we've had to increase our workforce's hours, and even at that, it's pushing it because we're all limited to how many days we can work and how many hours we can work. So we need to be able to increase that workforce, and that needs we need to know that that is sustainable. 
So it needs to be three, four, five years funding, an offer such as that. Thank you. That's helpful. And um, Claire, if I can come to you, um, obviously in your remarks, um, we have, um, you know, substantially um, reduced rough sleeping. If we can do it during a crisis, what do we need to do to make sure that going forward everyone has a home? Well, that is, um, and that's been the focus of um, of, our, of our work for now, um, which has been really, uh, really important. Um, I alluded that to that kind of in my my initial comment. There's a there's a collective of nineteen organisations. Um, um, basically, uh, looking at the future um, and saying that one of the things that we have there that we're, we're seeking as a kind of a triple lock, and one of them is a no return to rough sleeping. And the way we do that is by prioritising more homes for everyone. Um, so it's about absolutely making sure that the next steps we are committed to for people, um, so the people that we housed in hotels during this period, um, that the next step for them has to be a step forward. It has to be a step forward into their own. Tenancies. Um, it can't be a step into. It can't be a step backwards to where they were. Um, and ideally, it's not even a step sideways into another form of temporary uh, accommodation. So, it's saying we know what ends homelessness, and that is a home. Um, we know this. We were committed to this already. Uh, and what we have um, is just making sure that the resources we put in going forward are absolutely geared towards permanent solutions. Um, and not more and more and more temporary uh, solutions. Um, so that that includes everything from um, macro issues like more house building, but also as they bring back on uh, these um, allocations and lets, and not forgetting what we've learned. You know, um, through this process, one, it is absolutely possible. Uh, look at what look at what we've just achieved uh, as a sector as a country. It has been significant, um, and say take that forward and never forget um, what the solution is. And make sure that's where good resources are aligned to the solution as a whole. The solution is always a whole. Thank you very much. That's um, very helpful. Um, that completes our questions and concludes our, our um, evidence session this morning. Um, the next meeting of the committee will be scheduled for next week, and that will be consideration of the civil partnership Scotland Bill at stage two, and will be notified in the business bulletin and via the committee's social media. In the meantime, any follow-up scrutiny issues will be dealt with by correspondence, which will be published on our website. As previously agreed, I will now move the meeting into private session. I suspend the meeting, and we will reconvene at 11.45 on MS Teams. Thank you all very much for your expertise and time this morning. Thank you.